very much for the introduction and for inviting me to talk today. Uh, so I must admit, I'm a bit of a, I think the term is a TED virgin. Uh, this is my first TED, not just my first TED to talk at, but actually my first TED to come to. And uh, I didn't really know that much about TED until Herb contacted me and asked me to come and talk. And um, I mean, you can tell I don't know much about it. I'm holding an iPad here, but to be honest, it's really just a few. <laughs> I'm, I might as well not bother. <laughs> Forget the iPad, it's just a piece of paper. Um, I've, also, I've also been emailing him all week, calling him Mr. Ted instead of Herb. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm still waiting to meet this guy called Ted. Um, maybe later on. And you'll see uh, I'm wearing my white coat. So, so Herb said, just come in something, something you feel comfortable wearing. And I, I feel comfortable wearing this. Uh, it could have been my swimsuit. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, sex, drugs, and emerging viruses. Or at least I hope to if the slides come back on. Did I press the wrong button? Uh, was it the... Oh, there we are. There, there. Maybe it was the insult over the, uh, the technology. And... Um, so I'd like you to put up your hand if you've heard of Ebola virus and the recent outbreaks. OK, thanks. What about SARS? Does anyone remember SARS? Yeah. A bit scary? Yeah. Uh, bird flu, have people heard of that? Put your hand up. Dengue, anyone heard of dengue? Yeah. Encephalitis, big outbreaks in India. What about rabies? Have you heard of rabies? OK, so put your hand up if you're a little bit scared by some of these things. <laughs> Many people are. OK. Well. Um, I started uh, working in these kind of areas 25 years ago when I went to Thailand. I was a medical student from Oxford. Um, you can see my, uh, my dress sense back then. wasn't much better than my dress sense now. Um, and uh, since then, I've had the fortune to continue working in Southeast Asia and in Africa and to build up a research group looking at emerging infections. Especially, I'm a neurologist. I work at the Walter Neurocenter here in town. And so I work especially on emerging brain infections. And um, I'm going to tell you a bit about a couple of the viruses we work on, just to then get the ideas across that, that I want you to think about. So one of the main diseases is Japanese encephalitis, which is a mosquito-borne virus um, transmitted from birds and pigs to humans. It affects this large part of Asia, as you can see. And that's probably 70,000 cases every year. Uh, about a third of, of, of children that get this disease die. And some of the sequelae, uh, survivors are left with, with problems like this, this child here. So uh, encephalitis is, is just one type of uh, emerging infection. And you'll all have heard of meningitis, I think, which is when the membranes on the brain are infected and inflamed. So in encephalitis, the pathogen actually gets deep into the brain itself and is, is more serious. Um, then emerging viruses cause hemorrhagic fevers or bleeding diseases. I'm going to try really hard to use uh, words that everybody would understand, like bleeding. But on occasion, I'll use words like hemorrhage. So apologies. I'll, I'll, I'll try my best. Some of them cause rashes only, and then some of them are, are, are cause respiratory problems, breathing problems. This child here is, is, is one of our earliest cases that we studied who had dengue hemorrhagic fever. And over the years, I, I think we've made some progress in, in the work that we've done. Um, this is actually my wife, Rachel, who's a pediatric neurologist, uh, helping uh, an Indian doctor uh, understand a bit about what this disease, uh, what this virus causes. So we've improved disease recognition, we've worked on diagnostics, uh, we've worked on developing treatments and also on vaccines, and especially with the work we've done implementing vaccines, we've, we've, we've had some successes. Um, this is the Institute of Infection and Global Health that, that Herb was talking about, and um, here we work on a whole range of pathogens of both humans and animals, and uh, we are doing some work on Ebola, and since this is topical, um, I thought I'd just uh, bring you up to speed with the, the most important features. We think the source of this virus is probably bats, and it spills over into humans. It causes a, a bleeding disease, and one of the reasons why it's so uh, scary is because it can spread by direct contact from somebody perhaps just mopping up the, the vomit of somebody else, which is why you have to wear these protective gears that you can see here. And there have been recent outbreaks of Ebola every few years in Africa, as we've heard. So we've been working on these diseases about 25 years. And, and in recent years, I've, I've been thinking a, a, about them. And this uh, TED conference is really a chance for me just to uh, share with you some of my thoughts about it. Because basically, I think that we're never really going to defeat these emerging pathogens as long as we continue to think of them as uh, terrible viruses out to get us. We need to really change the way we think of, of them. We really need to start 
looking at life from the, from the virus's point of view. So I want you now, for the next few minutes, just to imagine that you're a virus and, and, and think about what life is like as a virus. Um, the first thing is, we have to think about what a virus actually is. Here's a, in the center there, you can see a virus. This is growing in, it's dengue virus actually growing in some tissue culture. And the virus has a bit of genetic material, that's DNA or RNA, and it's wrapped in a protein to protect it. And um, all the virus really wants to do in, in life is to, is to replicate, to reproduce. That's why it's here. Um, and to do this virus replication, it doesn't have the genes it has. It may only have 10 genes. It doesn't have everything it needs to replicate, which is why it has to go inside a, a human cell or a host cell or an animal cell, as you can see here. And it borrows bits of the reproductive machinery of the, uh, of the, of the host cell. Um, so this, if you like, is a, is a virus having sex. And uh, I'm, I should point out, for those who have just uh, clicked on the internet because they like the title of this talk, don't worry, there will be a little bit more sex coming up later on. <laughs> so hang on in there. Um, but they're pretty smart when you think about it. So with just 10 genes, this virus can, can reproduce itself. Humans have 24,000 genes. And you just think of what a song and dance we make of our uh, reproductive uh, mating rituals, let's call them. Um, and there were certainly some of these uh, rituals happening last night here in town in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> so the virus, as I said, has to go inside a host cell, a human or an animal cell, to borrow the reproductive machinery of that cell. And um, unfortunately, this disrupts the cells. So here's a happy layer of cells that we grew up in the lab a few weeks back. And there, here they are infected with a virus. And you can see they're very unhappy. They're shriveled up or they're large. They're, they're, it's, it's all... It's all a sorry situation. And so because of this, the host fights back. Uh, the host develops, a, we call it a host response. It, it's, a, it's an army, if you like, trying to defend the host from the virus. And so broadly speaking, viruses that have been successful have adopted one of two strategies so that they survive. They're either hiders or jumpers. So um, I'm going to ask you, a, I forgot to check. I am allowed to ask the odd question of people, am I? Yeah. I always ask, so I, I lecture a bit at the university, and I find it gets, uh, I, I'm hard to imagine, but I do get sick of the sound of my own voice occasionally. <laughs> uh, so it's a bit more interesting. So I want you to think, can anyone think of any virus, and shout out if you can, that perhaps hides away and then just pops out every now and again when it needs to? Hides away and... Say again? Herpes, I heard. Was that the first thing I heard? I think it was, thank God, because that's what the next slide is. <laughs> it's always a risk. <laughs> so... So here's the herpes virus. Uh, it gets uh, transmitted from uh, uh, one uh, mouth to another. It causes cold sores. And the virus actually pops up there. You can see up to a nerve at the back of the face called the dorsal root ganglion and comes down every now and again to see if it can get passed on to somebody else. But sometimes it actually goes the wrong way and goes right up into the brain and causes, if you like, a cold sore on the brain. And um, uh, this is a picture showing that, showing all this inflammation. This is a slide I borrowed from the Encephalitis Society, who are people that we work with in this area. So what about the jumpers? Uh, you've all had a chance to think. Shout out some ways that viruses jump from one person to another. Sneezing. Sneezing. Go on. Sex. Coughing. Keep going. Sex, Sex is good. <laughs> <laughs> Sex is always good. Uh, <laughs> anything else? Cash points. Cash points. Interesting. <laughs> That I wasn't expecting. I'll, I'll, get on and, <laughs> I'll get on and show you my list. Cash points is not in there. I'll, we, we, we better have a chat at the end, you and I, my friend. <laughs> so th this is my list. And because I'm a medic, as you know, medics love to show sort of slightly gory pictures, especially on a Sunday morning, check everyone's awake. So here's a respiratory pathogen being spread. Uh, here's a gastrointestinal pathogen being spread. Uh, this is mucosal spread from uh, one person kissing another. The insect born, uh, this is a, a, a mosquito that's sucking up the blood from one person and, and at the same time passing on a virus. Um, yeah, I wasn't really sure. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure what I could get away with at this time of day. I, uh, I thought I'd better play safe in the end. <laughs> so, um, uh, so these are the different routes of spread. Now, all those viruses we've talked about, humans are the natural hosts for those viruses, which means we pass them among each other. They may make us a little bit sick to help the virus be passed on, but they, in, for the most part, they don't tend to kill us very quickly. And this is because it's not a very smart strategy for a virus. If you kill your natural host very quickly before you have the chance to be passed on, you're not going to be passed on. 
So most of the viruses we've just talked about, we wouldn't really consider as the nasty emerging ones. Now, there's a different type of pathogen called zoonotic infections or zoonoses, and these spread from animals to humans. And these are many of the ones that we would consider as emerging. So here's this Japanese encephalitis virus again. It's transmitted among birds naturally, pigs pretty naturally, so they don't get too sick. And when it gets to humans, we get sick. And this is a, a, a figure of many of the emerging pathogens in recent years, and the majority of them are actually uh, from animals, they're zoonoses. And a large number of them are transmitted also by insects or ticks, we call them arthropod-borne pathogens. So how have they evolved to use these different routes of transmission? Well, anyone know who this guy is? This is Darwin, that's right. And uh, he drew this uh, family tree or phylogenetic tree of organisms showing how they're related. And he thought the way that they evolved was through natural selection and survival of the fittest. He didn't know, of course, back then that, that DNA was at the, at the essence of this, that the DNA or RNA, the genetic material, is how these messages are passed on. Now, you'll hear it talked about as the genetic code or the recipe. I mean, when, when I'm talking to my kids about these things over breakfast, uh, <laughs> which isn't too often because they don't really like talking about these things over breakfast, but I say more it's an instruction manual. It's like an instruction manual that comes with a flat pack. And you've got the mum's instruction manual, the dad's. They're slightly different. And to make the offspring, you put the instruction manuals together with bits from both. And, um, you know, if, if you're lucky, the kids will have mum's uh, lovely hair. Uh, if they're unlucky, they'll have my big nose. I think our kids got lucky and they had mum's lovely hair without my big nose. Um, and occasionally, though, in the copying process, there's an error, as you can see here. And that error was really what uh, Darwin was thinking about when he described his different finches. And... Um, so this is just to sort of explain this in simple terms. Here are these finches. They can just about get enough food to produce one offspring. Um, but one of them, there was an error in its genetic code, and it got this slightly longer beak. And the longer beak means it gets food more easily. So instead of having one offspring, this one can have three offspring, and there they are. And then you can see this gene, this lucky gene for the big beak, was passed on. So those three babies, again, these baby chicks, they're also going to have three offspring because they've got the, the big beak. And so it goes on. And you can see then how uh, a, a small change gets selected for if it's advantageous. Well, that was the finches. Uh, we don't work on finches. This is a disease we do work on. Does anyone want to really excel on a Sunday morning and tell me what they think the disease is here? I'll give you a clue if you need it. There's a hand, a foot, and a mouth. <laughs> OK. So this is hand, foot, and mouth disease. It's caused by Enterovirus 71. It's one of the diseases that we're studying out in Asia. And um, what we are seeing, even during outbreaks, even during single outbreaks in one season, when we follow the different viruses, here's our Darwinian, Darwinian phylogenetic tree, you can actually see the changes in the code even during one season. So this is partly what's happening. Viruses can evolve much quicker uh, than many other species. And why are we seeing more of them? Well, who'd like to tell me what this is? It's quite pretty. It's flight paths, yeah. So this shows you the airline routes and the number of airlines flying each route in a 24-hour in a period. And basically, things have changed a lot from Darwin's day, as you can see on this figure here. So um, in red is the time it takes to get around the world. And about 150 years ago, it took about a year in a ship. Now you can do it in less than 24 hours. And also, there's many more of us. In green, you can see that there's about, well, 7 million people now. It's a slightly old figure. And there used to be, 150 years ago, hardly anybody. And then other things have changed. So lots of things have changed which put, put pressure on the viruses and other emerging pathogens. So it's not so much, if you look at it from their point of view, it's not so much that they want to change, that they want to do something different. It's just that the environment, in its broadest sense, is changing. And they can't help, uh, if they happen to have a genetic change, they can't help going down that path. So what are we doing? How, how, is the, how is the environment changing? We have these overcrowded cities uh, where lots of people are packed together. We're changing our agricultural practices, intensive farming, uh, intensive transport of crops and, and livestock. We sometimes live very close to our animals, and, and the climate's changing as well. And I'll give you just one example from Nepal where we're working on Japanese encephalitis. So it's transmitted by mosquitoes, and we used to find that all the disease was in the low-lying area the terai where the rice paddy fields are. But you can see year by year, the number of cases up in the highlands uh, has gone up and up, and it's changing. And there might be a number of possible reasons for this. It could be climate change. It could be that we are 
putting rice paddy fields up there. It could be we're changing the way we look after pigs, which are hosts for this virus. So lots of things could be contributing. Drugs is another area. I promised drugs in the talk title, so here are your drugs. Um, this is another area where in, we're impacting on, on how uh, bugs change. So for example, uh, if we use antivirus drugs or antibiotic drugs, uh, the fact that we use them causes the viruses and, and, and bacteria to change. They can't help it. And if we use a lot of antibiotics in farming, as we do, to encourage these animals to, to grow, they're not sick. They don't need the antibiotics because they're sick, but they just grow a bit better. But the problem then is you've got low levels of antibiotics. And of course, the bacteria that happens to make that little change, which means it can grow a bit better, just like the finches did, it's going to flourish. And then that means when we get infected with that bacteria, the antibiotics that we want to use are not going to work for us. So are we at risk? Are we at risk? Who's worried about risk? Well, if you're worried about risk, let's just stop and think about this a little bit. The riskiest thing uh, any of us will do today is get here, OK? One of the riskiest things you've done is just get in the car and get yourself here. And five people are killed or seriously injured in this country every day. So you've got to keep risks in proportion. Um, does anyone spend a bit of time doing a bit of this? I know there are a few of you, because I met some of you last night. <laughs> You're not going to own up to it now, but it's slightly crazy to be up at night worrying about emerging viruses when you're spending your daytime actually harming your health anyway. I'll stop evangelizing. What can we do? Um, there's things we can do as individuals and as a society. As individuals, we need to just be a bit sensible when we're out and about in the sorts of places you can get these infections. Take your mosquito spray, um, tuck your trousers into your socks. If you have long legs like me, you can get your mother-in-law, as I did, to create these trousers with a little bit extra at the bottom. <laughs> I, I should have put them on, actually. Uh, and you'll, nothing's going to get through those, I can tell you. Um, and also, if you're working in these kind of environments, you've got to be sensible about looking after yourself uh, to, to make sure you're not unnecessarily exposed. And we need to avoid dangerous contact with animals. Um, you're probably OK kissing your pet greyhound if you're in a country like this. But if you're coming across uh, animals in overseas where they might have rabies, where perhaps a, an animal by the side of the road behaving a bit strangely, don't go up and give it a kiss and a cuddle. Keep well away from it, because it may be harboring a dangerous pathogen. And as a society, what can we do? Well, we do need to put uh, research funding into understanding how and why these pathogens are spreading so we can do something about it. And in fact, the government has recently given a large amount of money into this area. And uh, we've been fortunate to set up a health protection research unit in emerging and zoonotic infections just, just up the road in, in the Institute. But finally, uh, what's the idea worth spreading here? Well, I think we need to get away from this idea that these are terrible emerging pathogens that are out to get us. As I hope I've demonstrated to you today, it's not their fault. And a lot of what is happening is caused by us. They're not out to get us. Uh, many of the things that we're doing are actually driving pathogen emergence. And it's only if we start facing up to that that we'll begin to do something about it. Thank you very much.